described as the new wars, for example, by Mary Calder. And like the old wars, they do not show signs of sinking into obsolescence and still pose great challenges for those who wish they would. That's the argument. Now, the 100th anniversary uh, of the start of the Great War is a good moment for reflection and to evaluate such arguments. And so far, 2014 has not been a good year for those confident that we con can continue to avoid old wars. We have had Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe wondering whether his country's relationship with China might be like that of Britain and Germany in 1914. In late February, Russian President Vladimir Putin revived the tradition which we'd hoped had died out of occupying and annexing a region of a neighbouring country on the grounds that it contains people of the same ethnicity who require protection. Meanwhile, we've had some vicious examples of the new wars. Syria continues with almost 150,000 people now feared killed and more than half the country's population displaced. France is now involved in the Central African Republic, which is in a state of complete disorder, and more successfully in Mali. Nobody can really remember when the geographical entity currently known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo was at peace. Combined with the conflict, we can observe some increased preparations for war. After a sharp fall, after the end of the Cold War, world military GDP. American military expenditures are falling at the end of the Afghanistan commitment and budgetary pressures. China's, however, has been increasing steadily and is now scheduled to increase even more. Its wary Asian neighbours are responding in their own way. East Asia has seen some of the strongest growth in spending in recent years. Yet, lest we get too depressed by this, all this grim reading, Many students of war are urging us to step back from headlines and consider long-term trends. Here we're offered good news and an optimistic prospect. War as an institution, they insist, is in decline in terms of both the incidence of war and the numbers of its victims. This includes old great power, but also the new internal types of war. Moreover, this is not just the welcome relief of a few recent years, but a well-established trend according to one celebrated book from the start of recorded time. The optimists do not claim that this means that we are close to the abolition of war, or suggest that individual conflicts may not become extremely nasty, or that there might not be some serious perturbations in the general trend. But what these well-documented studies tell us is that we've experienced a continuing reduction in the quantum of world violence and we're approaching more civilised international relations, and that this might continue. To evaluate all of this, let's start with the old war. When we think of future conflicts, certainly those that might involve our own countries, our main concern must be with the sort of great power confrontation that scarred our continent so badly in the last century. And thankfully, it is these confrontations that show the most prominent and positive trend lines of decline. This had been particularly welcome, for it had not been the case, then few of us would probably now be here able to discuss the matter. We suffered two world wars over four decades, and when the second concluded in 1945, there was every reason to suppose that it might soon be followed by a third. <clears throat> The international system had polarised into two ideological opposed blocs, each led by a superpower. The United States and the Soviet Union were soon accumulating allies and arsenals. In particular, they both developed formidable inventories of nuclear weapons. If there was to be a World War III, it would be even more catastrophic, with great cities obliterated and whole civilizations eliminated. And this prospect, of course, was one reason why the war didn't happen. Instead, the two rival blocs settled down into a Cold War with high levels of military preparedness, but increasingly low expectations of actual warfare. It did not take too long before commentators and officials began to suggest that this stalemate might continue. Instead of a constantly shifting international system, 
with new powers rising and old ones falling, with ever changing configurations of alliances and enmities, the system congealed. The two blocs continued to face each other, actively planning for a complete breakdown, but increasingly acting as if this was unlikely to happen. In 1986, the historian John Gaddis wrote about the long peace that had been in place since 1945. He was not, of course, suggesting that we had been at peace completely over this period, or even that there had been no fighting that could be traced to the Cold War. Many people died in violent conflicts after 1945, including in Korea, Vietnam and Afghanistan. The point was that there had been no Third World War. And well over a quarter of a century has passed since that article was published, and the long peace has continued. It has now become more than welcome relief. It has become a defining feature of our age. Now, inevitably, one of the most severe criticisms of the concept of the long peace is that it plays down the death and destruction that was all too common during the years of the Cold War, and which was often fed by the Cold War. Yet even here, there is some good news far away from the major powers. Positive trends can also be discerned. We need to look at the actual evidence on the incidence of war and on casualties. The Human Security Project at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver provides the most striking decline that you can expect in the number of international wars. There have never been many of these, but they shrank from six a year during the 1950s, including anti-colonial wars, to barely one a year during the last uh, decade. Moreover, these are the wars which tend to cause the greatest number of concentrated deaths and injuries, and so this has led to a decline in the number of casualties. Over the past decade, the past couple of decades, the number of all conflicts, not just international wars, has dropped by some 40%, while the deadliest, those that kill at least 1,000 people a year, have declined by more than half. In terms of fatalities, the decline has been even more remarkable. In 1950, the annual rate was approximately 240 reported battle-related deaths per million of the world's population. In 2000, it was less than 10 per million. Even taking account of the growth of the world's population, that's still not an absolute and not just a relative decline. And that's to be thought that this just happens to be a fortuitous consequence of a set of consequences that could soon pass. There is also the argument that this is part of a historic trend that can be traced back through the ages. The most impressive statement of this case can be found in Steven Pinker's remarkable book, The Better Angels of Our Nature. Pinker marshals a great range of sources to demonstrate that slowly but surely over human history, there's been a steady move away from the reliance on violence to settle disputes but especially reliance on the most savage and egregious forms of violence. He has the numbers and theories to back it up. It's important to note he's talking about homicides uh, as well as wars, all violence. And it's worth noting the fact, the better angels of the book's title, Pinker gives for the decline of violence as a factor in human affairs. First, the development of strong states that could exercise control over the bands, tribes and chiefdoms that might previously have used force in their local power struggles. Secondly, the spread of what he calls gentle commerce, which works to mutual benefit and also encourages, by necessity, trusting relationships across boundaries. Femin third, feminization. Women, he argues, are less belligerent and unimpressed by displays of manliness. Fourth, the expanding circle of sympathy, by which he means the more cosmopolitan our society and the further beyond our own situation we can look, then it is much harder to dismiss the pain and feelings of others as irrelevant or demonising them as subhuman. And lastly, there is what he calls the escalator of reason, indicated the peak of might have been used in the past to justify pulling practices. <clears throat> Now, one of the problems for Pinker, um, and in the discussion of his theory, um, is what do we make of 
How can you argue that the world is living through a progressively more peaceful time when we've had the most substantial bloodletting in human history within living memory, which included the industrialization of mass murder in the form of the Holocaust? Well, one answer to this is to point out that the 55 to 60 million casualties of this war, measured as a proportion of the world's total population, does not put it at the top of the list. In fact, it becomes about the ninth destructive war in human history. So an important part of Pinker's method is to ask about the proportion of the world's population affected by violence, including homicides as well as war. And in terms of evaluating statistical claims over epochs, this may be reasonable and helps Pinker sustain his argument. But it does not really take into account the distribution of effects. The impact of the Second World War varied enormously. Some parts of the world were barely affected by hostilities. The level of American casualties appears quite limited when, co when compared with those of Russia, Germany and Japan. Furthermore, if we want to start getting into statist to statistical games, we could legitimately count this war twice, because it was in practice a combination of two wars, one that had begun in 1937 when Japan invaded China, and another that began in 1939 when Germany and Poland. They only merged when in December 1941 Germany declared war on the United States. The real question raised by the world wars, however, is one of causation. Pink is describing formidable trends, but he considers assessments of the balance of power to be only occasional and temporary in their effects. Therefore, he tends to discount them. But I think for our current age, we would argue that it's not just the material balance of power, but the assessment of these balances that make uh, a real difference. In 1913, one could have celebrated the onset of more civilized values, economic interdependence revo uh, resulting from the expansion of commerce, and at least in Europe, a peace that was now quite long and looked forward optimistically to the future. Now, we can now appreciate the contrary trends. Appetite for war is a sort of Darwinian test of fitness, the anxieties in France, and London, uh, in France and Britain about Germany's rise, or in Austria about the fragility of its empire. But in the end, war resulted from a particular sequence of events and human decisions. Part of those decisions was the view of the German high command that although they knew that their plans were a gamble, it was a gamble worth taking. And then we have the World War. The outcome of the war might have created the second, but it still needed Hitler's demonic personality, vicious ideology, and curious decisions. No social science of Russia, which was considered reckless even by his subordinates. Such a monomaniacal and mercurial individual is unlikely to follow trends and patterns, or even worse, might use the expectations these trends have created uh, to catch others by surprise. That's one reason why intelligence agencies charged with predicting future wars so often get caught out because they fail to take account of the potential stupidity of the people whose decisions they're trying to anticipate. And we can see this at the moment with people's attempts to assess exactly what Vladimir Putin is up to. It's one of the problems with wars that we can trace them to particular events and individuals. And while we can discern the vast historical forces that led to these events and gave them meaning, there are very specific factors of chance, circumstance and character that can turn manageable conflicts into all-out war. We therefore need to keep in mind that the future of war in general will be shaped by the expectations of political leaders about the future of specific conflicts. And with regard to these specific conflicts, a bold leader might find a particular strategy to a quick and relatively painless victory and, and makes this promise credible. It may turn out to be completely wrong 
Aggressors often assume that wars can be brought to a rapid conclusion, either because the victims will capitulate without a fight, or if they do fight they can be defeated quickly, or because their enemy's potential allies will stay their hand. Nobody knew that they were entering the Thirty Years' War, Hundred Years' War, uh, or even the First World War, Second World War. Thus, in his original Long Peace article, John Gaddis argued that the main reason why there had been no great power war was nuclear deterrence. On the grounds that war was demonstrably horrible enough without the bomb to encourage restraint, it's impossible to prove. All we can say is that nuclear weapons potentially took war to new levels of horribleness which were likely to be realised once hostilities began. This has been described as the crystal ball effect. The leaders of the states that went to war in August 1914 had no crystal ball to tell them the likely outcome of their belligerence. If they had done, they would probably have been much more careful. With nuclear weapons, there's no excuse. The worst that could happen was well understood and utterly frightening. And this has probably encouraged caution in circumstances which in previous eras might have led to war. It's not hard to list, to list the reasons why big wars are foolish and counterproductive, especially if the belligerents are both nuclear powers. Such wars could set societies back by decades, their civil and economic achievements in rubble, and their populations depleted and traumatized. But to state the obvious, it is possible to enter a war with conviction and enthusiasm about a limited but winning strategy and then get caught out if the opening gambit fails to work. If they do feel they need to use military force, leaders of the major powers will seek strategies to limit the duration and intensity of any conflict. <coughs> the trouble is that these strategies do not always work because others do not respond as expected. And again, it's something we might want to talk about in regard to Ukraine. In terms of old wars, therefore, the risk is not that states will knowingly get involved in a major war that it could exhaust their resources and threaten their very existence, but they might take small steps in the, the belief that they could control any further escalation. This may be a greater risk if they underestimate their opponent or just their ability to control events with which, by definition, <coughs> they're going to be unfamiliar. They might, but find it difficult once tested. Perhaps conflict between states with smaller nuclear arsenals and where the conventions of crisis management are relatively undeveloped might lead to more risk taking. Though they both tested nuclear weapons in the late 1990s, Pakistan and India have been close to war a couple of times since. Most commentators would suggest that the most probable, which is not to say likely, settings for wars between major powers would be in the Asia-Pacific region. There are, for example, worrying levels of antagonism fueled by nationalism between China and Japan with an ongoing dispute over the Senkaku Daoyu Islands. Should armed force be used by either side, then matters soon could get dangerous. But the most important development, and one in which Beijing might miscalculate, would be if the United States felt obliged to weigh in on the side of its ally, Japan. That seems to me to be the risk with major great power wars. What about then of civil wars? One of the strongest themes in Pinker's book is the importance of the development of strong states. This provides the most uh, important reason for the decline of violence since the, since the start of Pinker's narrative in about 10,000 BC. Here's a topic to decide the context between uh, the gloomy Englishman Hobbes um, and Rousseau um, as to who was more accurate in the descriptions of the state of nature between Hobbes' famous characterization of the state as being nasty, poor, brutish, 
and short, and, Rousseau, and Rousseau's more idyllic communion with nature. Hobbes, seems, uh, Hobbes' view led to a plea for a strong, all-powerful state, the Leviathan. Rousseau's led to the opposite conclusion, a weaker state, man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. And it turns out that Hobbes wins hands down. Uh, some have argued that the minimal evidence from prehistoric times points to a degree of harmony, but the evidence from the more primitive societies that survived into recent times does not support this. At any rate, few doubt that the most important factor in reducing violence over the centuries was the steady combination of smaller units which fought within and amongst themselves into larger units that could impose a degree of order. The role of strong states is captured by Max Weber's famous definition of the state as having the monopoly of organised violence. This definition immediately points to the conditionality of the argument. Conflicts are likely to emerge when a region or a minority believes itself to be suffering from a form of political abuse that undermines its identity. The of multiple states and overseas empires may have pacified some areas for some time, but the, at the price of creating a tension that led to future trouble. If states are defined by a monopoly of organised violence, then anything which is that monopoly as the state seeks to reassert its monopoly. To the extent it fails and the process goes into the large unit fragments into smaller units, then there will also be greater violence. Take as an example developments in Libya since 2011. First, there was a, ch a challenge to a strong state which just sought to reassert its control through violent suppression of the rebellion. When that rebellion succeeded, with NATO help, no strong government emerged to take the place of Gaddafi. One sort of violence was replaced by another as various armed factions began to fight each other for control of particular areas of Libya. In fact, as we view a Middle East in which the strong leaders that dominated the region until relatively recently have disappeared, we can see they've left behind states that are barely governable, and it's tempting to argue that much violence could have been prevented had the logic of autocracy been accepted. But the methods of the autocrats created the conditions for what followed them. Repressive violence in the end was the basis for long-term tranquility, just like abusive parents are often responsible for children who are abusive in turn. If to be supplemented by a basis for legitimacy, then it is likely to be brittle, especially in the face of some crucial state dysfunction, such as economic incompetence. European communism imploded because its repressive apparatus was insufficiently intimidating to cope with the evident bankruptcy of the ideology and the weakness of its economic model. The relationship between state formation and violence is therefore complex. One of the features of the world since 1945, in addition to the rise and the fall of the Cold War, is the growing pressure on the old European empires to the point where they have now all been dissolved and also the state. This is the continuation of the demand for self-determination which put a strain first on the Spanish, then the Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires, and finally the West European empires. None now exist. In the end, it was not capitalist rivalries, as Lenin expected, that did for imperialism, but rebellion and resistance by the subject peoples. This gathered pace after the Second World War. The last gasps of colonialism resulted in some sharp conflicts as I do not need to tell this audience, and these continued until the 1970s, until the revolution in Portugal, which is in part a consequence of its. In addition to decolonization, large states have struggled themselves together. The American Civil War is a striking example of this. 
take the example uh, of India. As independence was gained from, Bit from Britain, Indi uh, Pakistan split away from India, and then in 1971, Bangladesh split away from Pakistan. Since the end of the Cold War, the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Ethiopia and Sudan have ceased to exist in their previous form. While the Russian Federation still suffers from its own breakaway movements, it's now also itself encouraging secession in Moldova, Georgia and now Ukraine. Not surprisingly, this has led to, these two effects have led to a massive expansion in the number of states. When the UN was formed in 1945, there were some 50 members. There are now almost 200. And this has led to an increasing number of interstate wars, for example, between Israel and its Arab neighbours and between Pakistan and India, but not as many of these wars as might have been expected. That may, however, have been at the expense of more civil wars. Even the interstate wars have normally had an internal dimension. And we might add that the turbulence that we've seen in the former Soviet sphere since 1990, as well as the former Yugoslavia, is a consequence of past combinations of nationalities and territories that fail to respect the views and aspirations of those being combined. It has left a region in which states contain more than one nationality, and nationalities that extend over more than one state. Therefore, if one looks back over the past two decades, we can see that issues of nationality and identity have, pushed, have been pushed to the fore and caused considerable turbulence. These factors have constantly caught out those attempting to predict future conflict. Consider an article published by five Norwegian scholars in late 2010. This sought to extrapolate forward from the trends that we've described of decreasing violence to the middle of this century. Looking only at civil wars, the authors offered the comforting prediction that by 2050, the proportion of countries in conflict will be reduced to half the present rate. At the same time, they considered their methodology sufficiently robust to offer alerts as to where civil might, wars might break out. For example, there is a 21% probability on Tanzania being in conflict by 2030. In constructing their model, they looked to population side, infant mortality rate, to the history of conflict in each country and conflict in their immediate neighbourhood. Because the model put a lot of weight on population size and poverty, as well as evidence of past conflict, it identified Africa, as well as East and South Asia, as being prone to civil wars. It didn't say much about the Middle East. I was struck of the 40 countries on the list of being prone to civil war, end of 2010, Syria was not actually included. In an interview in late 2012, one of the leaders of the project acknowledged that conflicts in the Middle of the East had weakened the clear correlation between socio-economic development and the absence of civil war. The fighting in Syria and Libya had shown, quote, we also have to include democratization processes in the model. I mentioned a few minutes ago the importance of these issues of identity and sovereignty in the formation of modern states. Let's look again, because I want to emphasize the importance of political decision and choice rather than correlations of trends in these decisions. Let's just look at Africa, which has had relatively few interstate wars, but a lot of civil wars. Now, colonial borders, as we know, were drawn from ad for administrative convenience or as a reflection of what happened um, to a particular, uh, to who, ha sorry, what hap who happened who happened to own a particular territory at a particular time. Their decisions often made little sense in terms of either geography or ethnography. Lord, Sal Lord Salisbury famously put it, quote, we have been engaged in drawing lines upon maps where no white man's feet have ever trod. We have been giving away mountains and rivers and lakes to each other, only hindered by the small impediment that we never knew exactly where the mountains and river and lakes were. 
Nevertheless, as the era of the the organization of African unity made the deliberate decision to stick with the existing borders because they feared that doing otherwise would open up a can of worms. The consequence of this decision was that there have been relatively few interstate wars, but numerous civil wars, which have plagued the continent for over half a century, starting with the Congo. Again, the nature of the international environment does not reflect impersonal trends, but decisions made at critical moments by people making best guesses about what the future might hold and where the dangers lie. Because of the presumed link with socio-economic development, the Norwegian model I just discussed depends a lot on UN projections of poverty reduction. As these UN projections are optimistic, they appear then as the driver of peaceful changes. If they turn out to be wrong, the position darkens. But one reason they might be wrong is if poverty reduction turns out to be um, dependent on conflict reduction, and there is a vicious rather than a virtuous cycle. <clears throat> Again, we must note the need for a more sophisticated model of political effects. A great boost in recent years to poverty reduction has been China's rapid economic growth. This contains seeds of internal conflict, which obviously worry the Chinese leadership, because the benefits are be distributed. It's also revived concerns about interstate conflict in the region as China has started to assert its strength. The other reason for hope about the future in the Norwegian model is that it assumes that the wider international will assist experience conflict to prevent a recurrence. This issue is important because of one of the strongest and unsurprising findings from research into conflict is the best predictor of where conflict might occur in the future is where it has occurred in the past. Violence <coughs> is habit forming and it's a habit that's hard to shake off. Colleges that when states fall apart, perhaps as a result of economic distress, fail political institutions, social relationships, then it can lead to a sudden surge of disorder. This is why, as we saw over the past few decades, a real and genuine relaxation of in regular internal order within particular states, especially those that are comparatively new, having gained their independence from the old empires or seceded from the multinational states. And it's only in that sense that we can talk about new wars, going back to my opening reference to the transformation thesis um, employed by such people as Mary Calder. In their character, they're not at all new. Throughout history, societies have torn themselves apart with considerable violence as local disputes and rivalries have become unmanageable. Such violence sometimes peters out through exhaustion or else one side prevails or a regime has been overthrown and replaced. Sometimes end and societies suffer a recurring disorder. These wars represent continuity rather than novelty in human affairs. What has been different is how they have caught the attention of major powers. The powers understood the, the difficulties of holding on to territory in the face of a hostile local population. The intervention of the affairs of the third world the strategic importance of the, uh, the of the Cold War, the American experience in Vietnam during the 1960s and the Soviet Union's during the 1980s in Afghanistan that suggested that in substantial interventions were unwise in support of regimes with limited popular support in countries imperfectly understood and against patient and resolute enemies. After the end of the Cold War, the breakup of the former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia added to the many new states that were once part of the former European empires, and lots more new states. Some of these were deeply divided and became the set settings for brutality and cruelty, notably Croatia and then Bosnia, potentially affecting their wider neighbourhoods. No longer preparing for old wars, the established powers had the capacity to engage with these conflicts. For a while they did so because of genuine humanitarian aspirations to strengthen the institutions and economies of the weak states 
or concern that they might turn to sanctuaries for various forms and in some cases uh, various forms of extreme and in some cases fanatical political movements. The New War's literature was prompted by the periods of regular intervention that began with the Gulf War in 1991 and peaked during the 2000s with the campaigns in Iraq and Afghanistan. What was to external conflict external meddling? Western armed forces became very busy with these and had to learn or relearn forms of war different to those geared to fighting states with military established were mixed. Degree of popular support, the role became increasingly contentious. On po opponents could the extraveners therefore had to uh, use levels of tact and discrimination that would have been irrelevant in battles between regular forces. These interventions are now seen to be much more problematic because of the frustrating and painful experiences of the past decade and evident fatigue amongst the populations of the serial interve interveners, notably the United States and the United Kingdom. This fatigue became very evident during the discussions over Syria last September. These interventions were always discretionary and required governments to make a compelling case to sustain political consent at home. This became harder in the face of casualties and without obvious political progress. The legacy for the moment, therefore, is a deep aversion to inserting large-scale ground forces into quarrelsome and inhospitable societies. Should it become necessary, deemed necessary, to take punitive action against a cruel regime or terrorists using chaotic societies as bases from which to mount attacks across borders, then the current preference drawing on the development of classes of weapons that offer high accuracy over long distances is to engage in either symbolic strikes or even targeted assassinations. The problem with such methods is that whatever their short-term effects, they provide no basis for the imposition of a political settlement because this in the end requires land forces. So violent political struggles will continue to occur. Regions and countries prone to conflict will continue to be so. Over the past 60 years, there has been an appreciation of the need for international interventions, whether in the form of to predict whether future action will occur. It will depend on circumstance. But uh, I offer as a concluding thought that there may well be a relationship between whether our countries wish to avoid engaging with these conflicts and their incidents. Merci beaucoup. It was a fascinating lecture, and I am sure you'll be asked a lot of questions. But I'd like to connect your lecture with some of the previous lectures we've heard. And I'd also like to follow up on your idea of the decline of war. Aren't we in the face of a de-ideology of war? Are wars less ideological? The Cold War was the last major ideological war. And second, Europeans, Westerners, according to Clausewitz, who doesn't think war should be a political instrument, may explain Europeans' behavior today. And the third reason is that when we are a third party in a conflict, we've always tried to be neutral regarding the ideological component of conflicts. But I think now we have to view wars as pure, sheer violence, uh, like Rwanda or some civil wars like in the Balkans, or to address root causes such as poverty, infrasocial issues, um, access to natural resources, for instance. But 
time and again we are trying to avoid politics, but politics resurfaces. Politics may ha have been less used now. There has been a political use of war. Look at Putin in the 21st century. Wars of the Arab. There are no political drivers for this conflict. Question. For us as Europeans, as Westerners who have tried to suppress the political aspect of war, as we have posited ourselves as uh, advocates of Clausewitz, so how can we put war back at the center of a political reflection on war? Um, well, <coughs> a lot of questions there. Um, ideology in the sense of socialism versus capitalism is clearly not that important. We're back to much more traditional um, forms of belief and conviction. I think you would, I would argue that even in the period when we thought ideology was a key driver, um, actually nationalism has always been much stronger. Um, I mean, I'm sure a number of you read President Putin's uh, annexation speech to the Duma on the 18th of March. Um, this was um, an expression of nationalism, pure and simple, um, uh, of uh, a feeling for Russia, of, of its civilization, of its cities, of its language, uh, and of its people wherever they were to be found. And that, of course, what made it um, a slightly scary speech. Um, but I think we underestimate nationalism, um, and perhaps because Europe, uh, Western Europe, saw the consequences of that nationalism have worked so hard to transcend it, to come through the EU and, and, and so on, that um, um, for it to be retrograde, actionary, um, and something to be, but it's very powerful. And of course, we, I suspect we shall see in the coming European elections something of a revival of European nationalism. We, indeed, we already are. So I think that would be my, my, uh, my first point. Um, I think really over the past years, you can see national powerful and continuing uh, influence on international affairs. And I think that puts question marks about poverty, resources and so on as root causes. Uh, it's a popular argument. I didn't go into it. Uh, at all this evening, but um, and clearly in these days, uh, very important. I mean, economic drivers, uh, access to raw materials were important. But to the extent that we have global trade, um, that seems to be less important. Not to say that it's not a factor. It's a factor, say, in, in Saddam Hussein's takeover of Kuwait in 1990, very much driven by economic factors, but there was a political component to it as well. It becomes an issue, as we're seeing in the question over Ukraine, because of gas supply. So I'm not trying to dismiss it as an issue, but I don't think it, it, it's a primary cause of war at the moment. Um, and has often been noted with poverty, the thing is, um, it's I mean, and often the personal um, survival of the regime is the best explanation for a lot of conflict. Even the surviving, the survival of, of the communities that provide the regime is uh, is an explanation. It, it's as basic as that. Um, and. and you know, to understand these conflicts, um, you know, to, to look at these great impersonal forces may lead you to completely miss what's going on. Um, you know, if we just try to make sense of what's going on in North Korea, um, where, you know, fighting within one family now appears to be, um, you know, uh, an indication it's not yeah, fighting it's outside <laughs> uh, an, indi an indication of trouble to come um, <laughs> is uh, you know judicious that we should never you know, the, these factors of personality uh, you know whether it's Hitler or Saddam or Milosevic or George Bush or Tony Blair are, are important Alors maintenant je vous peut-être me retourne vers uh, Bruno I'll turn to Bruno now I 
I didn't know what Laurie's line would be in this lecture, and that's what he said, especially for conflicts. But I'd like to uh, add a few points on the issue of reality or the causes to reflect on it as a lasting trend or not. And then I'd also like to reflect on the new causes of war. First of all, I think Lawrence and I agree on the fact that the data leaves no room for doubt. But I do think, and maybe you didn't do that sufficiently, that things have to be clear because when it comes to lesser conflicts between major powers, less conflicts between states, and the less number of civil wars all have different reasons. And you have said that since the 1970s, there are a lot less civil wars. Contrary to what we did say in the 1970s, statistically, there has been no return of warfare. On the contrary, there has been a decrease of war. In Western countries, we have felt there have been more wars, but because we were directly concerned by them. So when it comes to explaining this phenomenon, we have to make a clear difference between these different categories, because each of these different three different categories uh, have different reasons. I think there are six reasons to remember, because they all start with the same letter. Should nuclear deterrence come first? I do not know, but I do uh, think I am one of those who believes that it's hard to explain no military conflict between major powers, which is unique in history, without accounting for the fear of nuclear dependency. You uh, mentioned this a lot of physical angle and the 1911 major subsequent historiographical happens happened between the countries that least depended on each other in 1914. So I don't think Engel was completely wrong. Let me tell you why economic interdependency has a role to play today. Well, look at 2001. No, I'm sorry, 2002. India and Pakistan are about to go to war. But one of the arguments that convinced the Prime Minister to not go any further in this escalation is the incredible pressure from business, Indian business leaders, in favor of backing down. So this might be just an anecdote, but I think it is part of the way we have to understand that economic interdependency can put a check on warfaring. Second factor, international law, international institutions, democratization. One of the few laws of political science, if it is a law, is that democracies don't go to war. They don't go to war on each other. Of course, uh, political science will start discussing why this happens, and this is a never-ending discussion. But this is a reality, because today the proportion of democracies that exist throughout the world has been increasing since 1945 whatever criteria you choose to work. And the third group of causes is development. It's not necessarily poverty reduction, but there is a strong correlation, which doesn't mean causality, between a country's development level measured as income per inhabitant and its uh, tendency to be violent, and then demographics. Lawrence mentioned it, but I do think there's a precise concept which has to do with youth bulges in demographic, the population pyramid. And we can mock two precise forecasts, but one of the major predictors of a society's propension to domestic conflict has to do with age demographics. And we have statistical data on this. This is not a recent idea for the last 20 years. We've been reading a convincing and convergent work on this topic. So I do think we should be cautious. I'm rather optimistic on this note, but I think we should be cautiously optimistic. First of all, because the drop in recurrence of civil war, and you did quote one of the articles uh, I'm uh, basing myself on here, because as countries go through the demographic transition, they escape the youth bulge, and this will take another 30 or 40 years in sub-Saharan Africa. 
and I will not get into the game of saying Tanzania or Zimbabwe are running a higher risk of internal conflict in 2042, but if you look at the demographic transition and where it will take longer and you use that to predict domestic, well, it does highlight sub-Saharan And the other reason one comes to an interstate conflict once again um, only for three reasons. Well, first of all, because the memory of major tragedies uh, can slip away, fade away, and we can discuss this. I've always been suspicious of this idea of a memory of tragedy putting a check on political leaders because in 1939, the memory of Europe's major butchery is still fresh. That was the 1914-1918 war. So remembering the first or second or the three world wars of the, of the 20th century and saying it has played a role in preventing major conflicts in the world with deterrence, economic dependency, and other factors, well, this historical memory could fade away. Second factor, nationalist passions or fanaticism. And third factor, the limits of deterrence, because nowadays some nuclear players have not yet learned the rules of the game of deterrence. And deterrence is never perfect. There could always be a failure in this deterrence. So a major military accident involving military power still exists, even though it's less likely than it was a century or two ago. Uh, let me quickly address the new forms or new causes of war. I do not believe in this fashionable idea that uh, resources could lead to a war. This is not 1941. Most of the resources that were scarce and problematic uh, are renewable. Japan's position in 1941 is absolutely not China's position in 2014. Scarcity today is more of an economic issue than a geological issue. Kuwait for instance, may have been the last resource-based war. But what is striking, and this has to do with international law and institutions once again, was that there was a taboo. And the taboo was that an independent state, member of the United Nations, cannot be forced to disappear, to cease to exist. And that's why the 1991 intervention was so crucial. Of course, resources do play a direct or indirect role in many conflicts. But if China and Japan were to go to war because of an escalation with the uh, Sekaku Daiwayu Islands, which could happen tomorrow, it would have to do with nationalist fervor rather, when, rather than with the need for resources. If you look at um, China oil and energy companies today, they act like international players on an international market. They don't act like predators. And you can't understand Russia and Chechnya or the Caucasus if you set aside the geopolitics of oil and pipelines. But that doesn't mean that resources are the major driver in these conflicts. Will tomorrow's major wars look like yesterday's wars? Well, the answer is probably no. Without going into this well-known discussion, I think two factors will be causing rapid changes in the nature of war. First of all, the evolution of since yesterday, they were uh, only available to Western players, and today they're available to non-Western and non-state players. And second, the influence of the sphere of information and communication where conflicts today play out. In this context, is Western military supremacy lasting? Well, I'm less pessimistic than others are. I don't think we have yet reached the time when we can say that this supremacy is part of the past. If you look at the capability of the at China or Russia's military capability, there is still a huge gap with the United States. Um, we could use the cultural argument, training, or the idea that China hasn't waged a war since 1979, whereas the Americans do go to war uh, 
every now and then, and they have been doing so since 1945. After the Iraqi army, the American army is the best trained army in the world. But the long-term trend is definitely a decline in the uh, material military supremacy of Western armed forces. And lastly, there is this question we will not be able to answer today. And to use Pierre Asner's phrasing, the question is whether tomorrow's wars will be marked by the bourgeois or the barbarian or by pilots or martyrs or what combination of both uh, figures will characterize tomorrow's war. And if I wanted to mix two of our friends' uh, phrases, Pierre and Des Del Peche, it's a dialectic between uh, becoming more bourgeois and becoming more barbarian. And this is a dialectic differently in future. We're familiar with these categories, and we have been for a long time. Thank you, Bruno. I'll let uh, uh, Lawrence react to that, and then we'll open uh, the discussion. Alve will react again. Uh, I agreed with a, a lot of that, uh, um, in no particular order that uh, Bruno raised. Um, economic interdependence. Um, Norman Angel's book, The Great Illusion, which was published in 1910, is very famous because he explained uh, how foolish war would be. <clears throat> he insisted afterwards he never said it was therefore not going to happen. He always thought it was possible, but he said it was foolish, and he was right. Um, the great illusion to which he was referring um, was the idea that modern capitalist countries would be driven to war because of resources and colonialism. That was actually the illusion that he was trying to put down. And again, in that, he was right. Um, and of course, this idea of economic interdependence has grown. Now, during the Cold War, it was sort of irrelevant because the Soviet bloc and the Western bloc barely interacted at all, or that began to change during the uh, from the 1970s. <coughs> But now it's really important, and, and it's a fascinating aspect of current crises, is to watch the interaction between the geopolitics and what you could call the geoeconomics. And I think this is particularly true with Ukraine. Um, the Russian by Putin's ear, and then the news today from the North, is more important sanctions that our countries may come up with, uh, because they um, do shape the environment in which people, uh, in which governments fulfill their other obligations to people and trying to look after their prosperity. And for a country like Russia, which has depended upon the oil price um, and its ability to get investment into its oil fields and gas fields and so on, this is a big issue. So I think it's, a, it's, it's a, something that's different now. Um, in terms of its role in, in crises. And we can see this question of, of uh, commerce and finance making an impact in the way that, that crises are handled. And I think it will be an important thing to watch um, uh, both over uh, Ukraine but also over the islands in the uh, East China Sea. Second, democratization. Um, it seemed to me there was one thing to note, a significant correlation between, I mean, there, were two, there were two points of the argument. One was that democracies didn't go to war with each other, and secondly, when democracies did go to war, they were pretty ferocious and often won. Um, and uh, that was because of their ability to mobilize people. Also, you can argue, uh, actually, democracies tend to take better decisions in autocracies because the decisions tend to be more challenged uh, and critiqued and there's less dependent upon a Hitler or a Saddam making all the decisions. Um, one thing to argue that and another thing to argue therefore we must democratize countries in order for them to be peaceful um, because um, 
the development of democracy, as we know, takes time. And once it takes hold, uh, is undoubtedly beneficial. And I don't accept the argument that some countries aren't ready for it. I don't like that argument. And I think just as, even as we saw in Afghanistan, there is an appetite for it. I don't think we should ever dismiss that. But it needs institutions. It needs the rule of law. It, it, there's all sorts of things that make for stable democracy. So one of the ironies of the democratization argument was that it came in as a number of countries that considered themselves young democracies in the former Yugoslavia went to war with each other or became engaged. So it, it, it's like all of these things, it's not an iron law. It describes processes that have to be uh, have to be watched. Um, deterrence, um, talk a long time about it. There's just one point I'd make. It seems to me nuclear deterrence had a credibility after the Second World War because of the things we did in the World War. Not only had the United States used nuclear weapons against Japan, we'd done dreadful things about now, the ability to jump from an assumption that the conduct of war avoids civilians to one in which you are going to suddenly engage in mass destruction um, is quite a leap. Now, I don't think that undermines the basic point, because as we know, systems can break down very quickly and at the start of the first, second world war there were quite good intentions about um, you know, not attacking merchant ships not bombing cities and they lasted for a little bit but not very long um, so anybody who thinks of war shouldn't take comfort from the fact that we'd rather not uh, engage in mass destruction but it may just affect deterrence mm -hmm. um, Memories, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, so much of our political discourse is dominated by these memories. Um, you know, as, soon as, as soon as we imagine talking uh, to, say, Iran, people start bringing up Munich uh, because it's about appeasing somebody else. Now, you know, <laughs> for the Crimea, Sudetenland, there's a little bit too much uh, of closeness. Um, but, um, but the general use of Munich uh, as an excuse for not entering into a serious discussion of whether or not is by analogy. And of course, you know, it, it's as if the people at the time of, uh, of Munich in 1938 were trying to derive lessons from the first Crimean War. Uh, so, you know, please, quite an important discussion. And of course, one of the issues with, uh, in, in Asia is the lingering importance of the experiences of the Second World War on Korean, Japanese, Chinese relationships. It's a very powerful factor. So um, memories may decline, but it's surprising how resilient they are. And again, one of the things I think that often catches West Europeans out uh, is the discovery that um, people with which your dealing, say the Serbs, are moved by stories of battles from the 14th century um, uh, that happened to take place in a, uh, uh, in, a, in, a in, in part of um, where about to have our own referendum over Scotland in which the Battle of Bannockburn uh, <laughs> I think the, the stri what strikes me is the resilience of memory rather than um, rather than anything else. Uh, and that point, I think else. Alors, je vais passer la parole à, à la salle. Est-ce qu'il y a... So, I will open the discussion to the floor. I can see someone raising their hand, sir. Rates being blocked. And you said that the state has the monopoly of organizing violence, but organizing violence is expensive. So there is a cause for war that you haven't mentioned that has to do with defending one's supremacy. And when you want to defend the supremacy of your oil or financial industry, for instance, the Anglo-Saxon financial or oil industry, well, there were two risks. 
having oil prices based on any other currency than the dollar. This is what uh, Iraq uh, practiced. It's something Libya and Iran were considering, and all three were attacked. And the other major risk was an increase, a significant increase in Iraqi production since it had the lowest oil production cost. And then in a few decades, a free and democratic Iraq could have taken control of, of the global oil market. Uh, so it, it's not exactly the resources. It's the control of resources with differential costs. Thank you. Any other questions, Nicole? And then, sir, in the back. Thank you. I have one question. My comment has to do not with the analysis of wars, but with forced wars. And more specifically, it has to do with your use of statistics. I'm not questioning the many studies you quoted, but these statistics can lead to think that there are less interstate wars and less civil wars, and they make you slightly or reasonably optimistic about the future. And I find this surprising because what I hear nowadays in Europe are boots stomping. I hear, I see 40,000 Russian soldiers at the borders of the Ukraine. I see NATO military planes over Baltic countries. So the question is, do these statistics really help uh, forecast the irrational aspect of wars? They can maybe forecast the rational aspect that Bruno mentioned, but I think there's an irrational element in wars that goes beyond statistics. And the second idea, I don't know if there are less wars. I'm willing to believe you, but I do think that there's, obvi there's an obvious increase of violence in wars. What about terrorism? No one has mentioned international terror here, but remember the children killed in, in Beslan in that school in Russia. So that was the comment I wanted to make here. I think um, maybe your optimism based on these t doesn't account fully for the irrationality or the potential irrationality of Putin, for instance. The question uh, is a real question for Lawrence Friedman. It's your first lecture on deterrent. Galatian uh, is a deterrent. Is deterrence now just turning powers away from the use of nuclear weapons? We know the United States and Russia won't uh, wage a nuclear war, but does it really deter powers from a conventional war? Yes, let's listen to some other questions, but some countries have specifically said that their deterrence only has to do with nuclear warfare. So, Lawrence, could you a answer these two questions and comment on the comment that was just made? Question. I really don't believe oil explains why the United States goes to war. I mean, people have argued that it was oil that got the United States into Afghanistan, oil that got them into Kosovo. You know, the United States, especially at the moment, is almost energy self-sufficient. Uh, it, it, it had a very brief period um, turns out to be a brief period where it was weak in oil. The, the Europeans are far more dependent upon Middle Eastern oil than the United States. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, oil tells you why the Middle East is important. It, it's, you know, the, the George H. Bush had a comment that, that, that you know, if, if they only grew broccoli, which he famously didn't like in Kuwait, he wouldn't, uh, you know, it wouldn't be so interesting. Um, so it's true that oil makes some countries important. If, if uh, Iraq had succeeded in taking over Kuwait, it would have enormous control over oil reserves and state European or American. It's the idea that only West Europeans or Americans suffer when the price of oil goes up. The people who suffer when the price of oil goes up are the developing nations. They're the ones who are badly hit. It's a global problem, not a particular problem for American uh, um, Americans at the moment. Their oil prices, are, their gas prices are far lower than ours because they've got shale. So. I just don't think it works as an explanation. Not, oil is a fact as an explanation 
of what the Americans are up to. You, the, it's much easier to find uh, other explanations of why they went all. But it is important as explaining why the Middle East is in, does matter. That I would accept. But every policy you could imagine um, with regard to Iraq, for example, was followed by the West. Tried to appease Saddam. Uh, it, it tried to contain Saddam. It overthrew Saddam. Um, the, every, all policies were followed. Uh, so there wasn't just one way of dealing with it. Iraq mattered as a country, certainly because of the oil, but oil doesn't explain the particular, uh, particular all wars. There are other reasons for them. Secondly, uh, I really wasn't saying that I'm optimistic about the future. That wasn't what I was trying to say. No. What I was trying to say um, was that there are a lot of reasons for us to be cautious about the future. Um, however, the statistical evidence is very powerful. Do you count the numbers that have uh, killed immediately? Do you count the after effects, which are often more pernicious, more serious, and so on? It's, it's actually a very inexact science. But I think the, um, the basic trends are pretty clear. Whether they'll carry on is, is a completely different issue, and I hoped that I'd made that clear. Uh, so it's, it, but, you know, it, it is important just to keep in mind that despite our gloom, um, and I think Syria will certainly have knocked these trends uh, for this last couple of years. Uh, the, the, the trend is quite still nonetheless has been a positive one. On the role of deterrence, uh, it's always been an issue <coughs> as to whether nuclear weapons deter other nuclear weapons um, or deter all war. And this is partly a question of strategy. It's a question of how to think a war would develop. My view is that it's impossible to explain why anybody would actually initiate a nuclear war or even necessarily respond with nuclear weapons if somebody else had done. The thing is, we can't be sure, and that small level of risk uh, will always be in somebody's mind. So if, for example, Russia and the United States found themselves getting into a more serious confrontation over Ukraine, which I don't think will happen, but if we did, and um, they would, but if they'd said, um, fear not, because our doctrine is only to use nuclear weapons uh, in the face of a nuclear attack, you would say, I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm a bit nervous as to where all this might lead. Uh, um, and I think that's what the role that nuclear weapons have played. They've reminded us of why major war could be catastrophic. And so long as they exist, they do that. I'm not particularly comfortable with that position, but that's where we are. I think it's very hard to work out specific strategies for uh, how nuclear weapons would work. Uh, and, you know, I, I, the, the point that exist, and while they exist, they remind us why major war is probably going to be foolish. J'ai bien compris que c'était si je voulais, donc ça voulait dire que tu voulais pas. Mais non, d'abord, sur le pétrole. I did get it, I have to be brief. But regarding oil, all the countries that considered labeling their oil experts in another currency than the dollar didn't do it because it was not in their economic interest. In 2003 or 1991, if it had been about oil in Iraq, the smart sanctions, I don't really know if they're that smart, but the sanction regime could have let them and Miranda said, I spoke to him on another planet. Well, that is definitely uh, worrisome. So I fully agree with you, but I agree less when you claim that, and I quote, there is an increase of violence in warfare. I think if we uh, look in the long term, Bosnia and Syria are exceptions uh, rather than a true illustration of a historical trend. I think that throughout history, I don't uh, 
think that there has been a humanization. I wouldn't say this on the uh, day we are commemorating the 20 years of the genocide in Rwanda, but I don't think that could be uh, confirmed. Well, both can be said. Sir, you had a question. Thank you, Sir Lawrence, for your lecture. You have mentioned war a lot, but you did not discuss security or military capability. Let me give you an example. There is in the Ukraine because Ukraine doesn't have a military capability. So how do these factors go together? What is your take on that? Thank you. Are there any other questions, sir? I wanted to ask you what you think of all these regions that want to become independent, like Catalonia, Valony, uh, Scotland. Maybe that was your question. Well, not necessarily Scotland, but regions. Does this have to do with nationalism, or is this different? Is it a more economic claim? Okay, thank you. Can you answer these questions, and then I'll let uh, Hervé take the floor. Mm. Let me start with the second. Um, I was arguing that nationalism is an important factor. I mean, in our discussion with Bruno, um, it, it's the one continuity in national politics over the past two centuries is a people itself denied its political rights um, react, can react against it. And how you have it depends on how your society uh, evolved. Um, we're, we're having a great debate in the UK at the moment about Scott, uh, and, and you know, a lot of that is about the economics and whether it makes any sense at all for Scotland to try to be independent, which personally I, I wouldn't have thought it, it does. Uh, but the Scots will say that's not the point. Uh, now this goes against what we assume to be our caricature of Scots, but anyway, they're saying that's not the point. Uh, and we'll see what happens. But also, I mean, I think it, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting question of, of why a particular group of people themselves as a nationality and as a victim group or whatever, uh, and how that framing takes place. Somebody described these as imagined communities, but once imaginary power, identity and community, people in the body even more strongly, and that I think is is one of the a good place to end. Um, I mean, there is a curiosity about the situation um, in that, um, and it relates to this question of of insecurity, um, and partly our attempt to work out what Putin's up to. And just, perhaps just say a few words because I've just been doing a, a bit of work on this. Um, and there's a big debate going on um, between those, particularly in the United States, who basically say you cr uh, Putin's doing this because he can um, and because he's got a sense of the weakness of the West uh, and you know, goes back to Syria and the failure to respond to the red line and so on. And those, of which I would include myself, who believe that actually he's doing this because he feels insecure. Um, and the in, what's interesting is if you look back to statements being made last September, before the Syrian episode, by um, Russians, as much to Moldova as to the Ukraine, but also to the Ukraine, um, what was bothering them was the Euro EU accession agreements. That was really what was the threat. Now, we don't think of our lovable, soft power EU as being threatening to anybody. Um, but that is, I think, how they were saying it. And they talked, um, and there were threats to Transnistria, which is the strip of Moldova that they're now talking about again, even then as being you know, part of the leverage. So I think this it, it, it's about insecurity in the sense of vulnerability, and then you have to ask yourself, why does Putin feel vulnerable? Um, I think because uh, 
he sees membership of the EU potentially as a precursor to membership of NATO, but also a way of reviving these economies and taking them into a different direction to his own. Um, so insecurity is about vulnerability, is about what, what threatens you. It's interesting that in response, and it, you know, the Crimea move was clearly not improvised. It had been planned for some the Crimea move, I think, was always about trying to gain some leverage over Ukraine. If the first attempt, which was, a, which was trying to bribe the Ukrainians into going with Russia and against the EU, failed, uh, which is what, what happened, it didn't really, I mean, some people have died in, in Ukraine, but it, it, you don't really think of it as, as a war in the traditional sense, because nobody really fought back. There's an interesting question, again, as to whether one of the frustrating things for Putin is that the Ukrainians have been so passive. Um, because it, it, it's why moving into East Ukraine without being, uh, uh, when he is the one that will have seemed to have crossed the line, I mean, however much sort of fabrications he's making up about um, what the, the, the fascists and the Nazis and so on who are causing all of this. Uh, I think that, that, that is something that he's going to be wary of. But So these are very different sorts of crises and conflicts to the ones that we had in the past. You can see, com make comparisons with what happened in the, in the late 30s, but they're very different. Uh, and the economic dimension as, to, as well. So there's, there's a lot to watch and a lot to learn from all of this as well as just trying to anticipate how it will come through. Merci. Je te passe la parole et on reprendra des questions. Oui, je vais. OK, Hervé, then a, a last few questions. Yes, I'd like to address this long-lasting question, which has to do with where we're at in the long-term history of war. Are we at a moment of growth, of expansion, or of decline. And I think this question has to do with the scale of our analysis. And this is the fundamental issue because the higher you go in scale, the more distance you have to look at things, well, the easier it is to write trends and rationality. But if you look closer, if you go more into details, well, the multiplication of factors and causes and rationalities prevent us from seeing major trends. And it has to do articulating these different scales is often the problem when it comes to assessing the impact of war. First of all, because as a matter of fact, if you take a step back and look at the major trends and then you switch scales, it suddenly becomes difficult to see the implication of these trends. For instance, if you go back to before the First World War, the 10 years before the First World War, an author called Jean de Bloch wrote, that the progress in destruction capabilities had made war impossible because no state would rationally decide to war because if it did, it would uh, experience a socialist revolution. What a forecast, right? That was Jean de Bloch's analysis. But alongside Jean de Bloch, Gaston Boudard in 1913 writes a long, a very long history of the evolution of losses uh, due to war. And he concludes that there are less and less uh, casualties. And in 1913, he says the next war will be the less deadly war we have ever seen. And he's not be less deadly on a tactical level and thinks that there can be significant uh, not we face which makes it hard for historians to agree on the long-term history of war because they're just not discussing the same time frame 
And the second issue has to do with acknowledging the fact that violence isn't doesn't just have to do with quantities. It doesn't have to do with the number of casualties. It has to do with the nature of violence. That's why Nicole, for instance, just said that this hostage taking uh, the of children, which caused 80 deaths. Well, yes, if you compare it to major human catastrophes, it's a detail. But at the time, what that form of violence represented meant transgression, meant deviance, meant a violence that was suddenly absolutely unbearable. So there's the issue of the time frame, the scale of the analysis, and then the nature of violence. And this leads me to something that came to my mind because of David Bell's 2008 book on total war. David Bell brings total war back to Napoleonic wars, but he is working on Iraq because he's focusing on the birth, the genesis of war as we know it. And according to him, total war is the war in which there is no longer a difference between civilians and soldiers. And this doesn't have to do with numbers. It's actually a relative criterion because he thinks that war becomes total exactly when war steps away from humanity's perspectives. And that's why he mentions the Enlightenment because during the Enlightenment, the, a war was waged on war. Philosophers, and I'd like to say I don't fully agree with his analysis, but I do think it's interesting for what we're discussing now. So when war is banished from the normal order of the world, when you consider it as an abnormal status of civilization, well, that is when war becomes the most radical war it can be because you wage a war on war and you wage a war on the individuals you blame for war and you ban these individuals from humankind and decide they de they deserve to be exterminated. So my question is acknowledging or identifying a long-term trend of gradually exiting war for warfare, couldn't this paradoxically be a symptom of a greater brutality in our warfare? When we refuse, big issues. <laughs> That's why you're here. Very interesting issues that were evident uh, before the First World War. Um, by and large, the military view was that war would follow very similar forms to the forms that had followed since Napoleonic times, or that had been shown in, in 1870. Um, they paid very little attention to the civil, American Civil War mm -hmm. or to the Franco, mm -hmm. uh, or to the Japanese-Russian War. Um, and they paid very little attention to the machine gun, for example. Um, some very interesting studies have been done on that. The military got it pretty well completely wrong, um, uh, if, if you look back, because the implications of the analysis of people like Jean de Bloc um, and H.G. Wells and, and, and so on was that war... Um, was likely to be catastrophic in design. They saw it as you know, their role in defending the state and in pursuing the state's aims. And people like de Bloc got it right, um, pretty much. Interestingly, um, he was the SARS representative at the Hague peace conferences. Mm. Um, he, he was an active exponent of disarmament. Um, and you know, one looks back and why was the Tsar such a great fan of disarmament? Because he knew that Russia was not one of the most advanced military powers. Um, you know, the view of someone like H.G. Wells, who spoke about the atomic bomb, 
before the First World War, um, and who described war in the air in very vivid, uh, some amazingly vivid descriptions. But H.G. Wells was trying to argue for world government and socialism. I mean, that was his solution to the problem of war. So they all had their axes to grind. Uh, everybody's view was geared to their political agenda. Um, so strong with, with the professional military, and that should tell us something. Um, secondly, the change, our changing views about violence, and Nicole's point about king and so on. It's one of the features um, of contemporary conflict that the sort of a small change of warfare becomes very personalised when you know that they're the, they're the only people who are dying. Um, so we can count a name and empathise with and feel for every soldier, British soldier that's been killed in Afghanistan. And there's been a lot of them, but not that many. It, you know, it was half an hour in the Battle of the Somme. Mm -hmm. um, and there may become these statistics. They don't become real people uh, or their own personal tragedy. It, it, it's, we have, um, and you know, probably a good, a good thing rather than a bad thing, it, is a sense of, uh, of the individual victims in a way when war is... Uh, have. And I think it's also something to do with the media as well. Um, you know, the messages back from soldiers taking selfies and sending them back home, uh, even as they're you know, going into fight. It's a very different campaign. Now, you can watch now on, on YouTube um, uh, uh, Islamists in Syria with, with, you know, with, with, with their own videos, including when they get martyred. It's a very different sort of thing. And, and one thing we haven't talked about today, obviously not time now, uh, about uh, the effect of the media age and, and digitization and so on. Lastly, the, if I understood it correctly, um, war on war. Um, the idea of total war... Um, was a reflection, I mean, the, the, where the idea came from, was Ludendorff mm -hmm. and so on, was reflecting on the First World War um, and a sense that anything became a legitimate target in an industrial war because if you depended on the factories to produce the munitions, then the factories and the factory workers were targets. These were arguments used by the RAF to justify the bombing of German cities. Um, and so total war um, challenged the very idea of limitation and restraint, and nuclear war seemed to do that even more. But as soon as nuclear war came in, the idea of limitations returned, um, even the idea of a limited nuclear war. And that's what we've been grappling with ever since, is are there ways in which we can use government in an aggressive way following laws? Uh, and so on. And some people find the very idea of a law of war odd and repugnant, yet it is a powerful norm, and it does mean that when conflicts do develop, certain, um, certain things are followed that might not have been followed in earlier times. But it is, I think, one of the most difficult areas in this. And again, as we can see in Syria, um, and we saw in, in Bosnia, once the restraints begin to be loosened, um, then it's amazing how quickly you can get back into sheer brutality. Yes, but one can wonder if these aren't exceptions. Western countries were successful in leaving the business of extermination behind, and it was their business for centuries. I haven't read David Bell's book, so I'll feel free to comment on it, but I do uh, I did hear this idea you just developed, and let's have a quick comparison here. Pearl Harbor. The United States' immediate response was Doolittle's raid on Tokyo, incineration of parts. 
um, suitcases of cash, and then there are uh, unending legal debates on torture, on what can be done, what can't be done. And I don't want to generalize, but the idea that Western countries, exceptions set aside, like Bosnia, which was a Western country, well, it's hard for me to believe that Germany, France, the United States, or the UK could in the near future be prone to the kind of excesses that did exist until, until a relatively recent time in history. But then again, maybe it's just my opinion. Okay, well, uh, last series of questions. Uh, so any last questions for tonight's lecture, Dominic? Okay, you have the floor since you're closest, and then Dominique. Merci pour. Thank you for your lecture and for your answers. I'd like to stress something uh, that seemed to be in the background of everything that has been said tonight. It has to do with the cultural and religious aspect of conflicts. I would like to hear you on this aspect that may be neglected. Take recent conflicts like Rwanda. Rhonda had to do with two different communities. Look at Syria, Sunnis and Shiites. I think it's an important element, religion and the cultural phenomenon in a broad sense. Thank you. Dominique? Thank you, Lawrence, for this fascinating lecture. I have a question on something that hasn't been mentioned up until now. It has to do with cyber warfare. For many uh, military leaders nowadays, this is the first and foremost uh, threat. The New York Times has been mentioning high-level contacts between the United States and China to better know their doctrines on the use of cyber warfare. So a quick question. Can any lessons be learned from the confrontation between the United States and the USSR during the Cold War that could be applied to uh, what some people now call cyber deterrence? The person who uses this term is Admiral Rogers, who is the new head of Cybercom and the NSA. And things have been changing quickly in this field. And the third idea is if this cyber deterrence exists, and I'd like to hear you on this, aren't peace and war fading or blurring together and it becomes harder and harder to determine if we're at peace or at war? Thank you very much. I'll let you answer and next lecture. Um, on. Uh and the culture and religion of conflict, the Syria divide um, is becoming more and Shia communities, but because of the particular versions of both these um, uh, religious strands that are offered by Saudi Arabia on the one hand and Iran on the other. So it's not just that this is, I mean, I think that there's always a danger of talking about sort of primordial um, uh, ethnic, ethnic conflicts as if people can never escape from their cultures and these don't evolve and develop over time because they do, uh, but they don't always develop positively. And I think that, that that's one of the problems. Uh, just on Rwanda, one of my students who I wish would write up his thesis did a brilliant study on, um, on the influence of Christian doctrine on the massacres in Rwanda, particularly some of the Old Testament um, discussion of the Amalekites and, and so on, which we, you know, nobody in our cultures would even think about. But they provided a basis 
for the annihilation of a people who you thought were consumed by demons and and so on. Even though you know the distinction between Hutu and Tutsi goes back to you know uh, Belgian administrative conveniences of a hundred years ago. Um, so it's the way that these ideas develop in the area. It's very important. Um, it's not that these religions and cultures are unchanging over time. They do change, just not always for the better, but not always. Cyber warfare, gosh. A, I don't like the term. Uh, it suggests that there's a, a separate sort of war in something else that could decide disputes between states, and I don't think it can. Um, it's uh, a regular... It goes on all the time, most of it involving criminal gangs, uh, sometimes uh, kids trying to see what they can hack, um, sometimes activists. Uh, it, you know, it's going on at the moment over Ukraine, it's going on at the moment over Israel. Um, there was uh, a major attack on Estonia launched from Russia um, a few years ago about exactly the same sort of issues, but Russia didn't want to um, use anything that could be considered violent against Estonia, so you had denial of service and strange things appearing on websites and so on. But it was, I mean, it, it, it's inconvenient, um, it can be unpleasant. If taken too far, it could be dangerous, but... Um, it's never quite got there yet. I think it's actually, so, you know, um, you know, propaganda and deception and so on, certain roles often in the same uh, uh, We've seen in the whole time, sort of sweeping up every bit of electronic information they can find, whether the NSA is, whether the GCHQ is, whether you are. Uh, um, so there's all sorts of really important issues here, uh, and they will make a difference to the conduct of future war. They already do, um, but it's ancillary. I don't think it's determinate. Uh, and that could change, but I don't think so at the moment. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you very much. Thank you for tonight. We will not be parting immediately because you know we have our symposium on Thursday, 9 a.m. in the Liyard Conference Hall, and I hope some of you will be with us. It will last all morning and all afternoon, so all day on Thursday, and the program is available on sign up. Friedman, thank you so much for being here when we started and ended this cycle of lectures. Thank you for honoring us with your patronage and the fascinating lectures you provide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you coming for dinner?